Okay, uh, good day everybody. Let's get started. Uh, my name is Fabio Ramos and it's my honor to introduce the next keynote speaker. So Professor David Su uh, received his PhD from Stanford University. He then moved to uh, Singapore where he is currently a professor at the National University of Singapore and is the chair of the department. Uh, David's research has been uh, very inspiring to many of us working in uh, decision making under uncertainty. In fact, if you ever read a paper on partially observable Markov decision process, you most likely read one of uh, David's uh, uh, groundwork in that area. Uh, many of us in the uh, robotics community would uh, consider or well, used to consider pound EPs as a theoretical area uh, uh, with not many real applications in robotics. But I think David really changed our minds with his work, where he showed that pound EPs can actually do great things for us in real robotics, particularly in dynamic environments, uh, while navigating among crowds of people, for example. But he, his research goes way beyond pound EPs and include, you know, new developments. Uh, like differentiable algorithm networks, uh, developments in, in base optimization, uh, motion planning, and I'd say pretty much every aspect of making decisions under the uncertainty. This is perhaps the third time I'm introducing David, uh, and I hope to do this many, many more times, because as you see, uh, we love his talks, we, we learn a lot from them. So with this, I uh, let David speak. David, the Zoom floor is yours. All right, let me share the screen first. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Fabio, for the uh, introduction. Uh, just one correction, I was never the chair. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here and to speak our work on integrating planning and learning. Uh, learning is relatively uh, new to me. And, uh, and as uh, Fabio mentioned that ever since I was a graduate student and years after I have been working on motion planning and then planning under uncertainty for robot decision making. Uh, so I'm very keen to find out how uh, learning connects to things that I, 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 I know about. And also that uh, uh, maybe that uh, learning will replace a lot of things that I used to know, we used to know about. And here I wanna um, tell you some of our findings. Uh, let's start with a concrete example of robot decision making. Suppose we want to get our robot vehicle to drive through this busy intersection. Right? So there are a lot of challenges. We have dense traffic. We have a mixture of cars, motorcycles, and the pedestrians. We have uh, uh, many of them, and then they all have complex dynamics, and they all interact with each other. On top of all these, uh, we have uh, uh, the usual uh, challenges of robotics, imperfect robot vehicle control, noise centers, and blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, how do we build a robot decision-making system for this? Uh, here's one abstract view of the robot decision-making system. And uh, so uh, the input to the system is a history of uh, um, observations or sensor data, and the output is an action for the robot to execute. Uh, for the current time instant. So the, the system basically is a mapping from uh, input observations to output action. So it's a mapping. So we can represent this mapping as using a, a neural network or maybe any other uh, powerful, sufficiently rich functional approximators. Uh, if we have enough data, we can train the neural network using data and for an input and output association. Uh, this seems to be a simple uh, idea. Um, um, maybe it's a bit too simple, but with uh, lots of evidence for success, especially in recent years. Right? Now, suppose that we succeed uh, in um, building such a robot system. One kind of question when we ask is, uh, what if uh, we want to change the robot? Um, 
or maybe you want to change the sensor, or maybe you want to just change the um, placement of the sensor. Maybe you want to change the objective by driving to a different destination or maybe manipulate different objects. So what will happen then? Well, one likely answer and most likely answer is that uh, probably we'll have gathered data again and train the robot system uh, from the scratch. And that's of course uh, very undesirable. Now to cope, uh, uh, to cope with this uh, um, variability, uh, one way is to um, put in more structure into the system. So we uh, identify structural elements, um, the, uh, such as the um, models and the algorithms, for example, the uh, state transition models for the system dynamics, uh, the observation models for the sensors and the reward models to capture the, our objectives. Uh, we can also put in uh, elements such as the algorithm, in this case, a planning algorithm. The purpose of the planning algorithm is to take as uh, input uh, the sensor data and reason about this uh, sensor information together with a model to output an action for robot execution, right? Now, uh, because of this structure, now if we want to make any changes, for example, when change the robot, we can replace T. Um, or if we want to change the sensor, we can re replace the observation model Z, while the remaining structural elements will, re will, will, will be unchanged. Right? Now that's a benefit of a structure. Now, uh, what can we what can learning do here? Well, le we can learn the models, of course, but maybe we can also learn to improve the algorithmic performance of planning. Right? So here, uh, I'm mostly focused on planning, but but the system may contain other structural components, for example, uh, filters and controllers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this is in fact a, a classic modular view of the system. This is how robotics, robot system are taught in the class. And for most of the robot system in existence today, this is how they are built. Right? Now uh, we have two um, seemingly very different view of robot system. Uh, one view is that uh, one views the, um, robot system as a mapping from the input to output, input perception to output actions. It is sometimes uh, called a model free, but it, because it uh, uh, has very little um, domain specific or task specific structural elements in it. Well, I don't think it's really free. Uh, well, even it's a neural network, it still is a model. It has, uh, um, it has it's a structure, it's hyperparameters. So, uh, but it doesn't, ha it doesn't have those uh, um, task sp specific a domain specific structure. So let's call it the weak models. So the, these uh, uh, models are data driven and they are optimized for task objective. And, uh, and, uh, and because of this optimization, uh, it is usually very robust. Right? Now on the other end, uh, the model-based approach, uh, we have this structured view of the system that contains of structural components for filtering and the planning and the controllers and so on and so forth. Each of the component has a dedicated purpose. They are structured, each of them interpretable. The overall system is modular, uh, composable, and because of that, uh, leads better generalization and generality, right? Now, if we go to the social network, and uh, this debate uh, becomes a lot more uh, interesting and maybe even more entertaining. And uh, so uh, this post here says that, uh, 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 planning and control is, is a king. Uh, it is rigorous and with mathematical guarantee. It's much better than, than, than learning. Well, I'm not sure that uh, by, by referencing the monarchy necessarily established the, the superiority of an approach, but let's keep in mind that the mathematical guarantee usually comes in the form that if the modeling assumptions all hold, then the guarantee also holds. Now for any um, specific robot system in, in practice, how do we know the modeling assumption actually holds? And that is oftentimes the weakest part of the model-based approach, right? Now the response coming from the learning side is much shorter. They usually will just say, well, can you do this? Or can you do this, right? And then now, Let's keep in mind though, that for this specific instance, this is the, the success of the tasks that are demonstrated here, in fact, are fairly narrow. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we change the robot or change the objective, change the object, uh, we probably have to learn, uh, relearn everything from scratch, which is highly undesirable. Now, uh, if we uh, set aside our uh, um, uh, ideological bias or personal preferences, 
maybe we can put these two approaches together, right? If you examine the arguments on both sides, um, in fact, they're both correct, except they just don't connect as if they live in um, two parallel universes, just talk about different things. If we put them together, maybe we can get the best of both worlds. That's what we have been trying to do in the last couple of years and I wanna talk about next. Uh, I wanna start with uh, um, the planning perspective, the perspective that I'm most familiar with. And I wanna ask the question, uh, what can uh, learning do in the context of planning and what should we learn here? Uh, uh, for planning, uh, we need to have a model. Uh, we can take any uh, general system model. It could be a partially observable Markov decision process, stochastic optimal control, anything that's similar, LQG or, uh, or something. So they usually consist of elements such as states and the actions and the observations. So for example, that the, the, the state will consist of the um, poses of all interacting vehicles. We will have a probabilistic state transition uh, model to capture a system dynamics, um, uh, uncertain system dynamics, because we're not so sure, for example, whether the interacting vehicle will go straight or make a turn and right uh, cut in front of the eagle vehicle. And similarly, we can have probabilistic observation models to capture sensor noise, and as well as a reward model to, um, to capture the kind of the uh, objectives we want to achieve for the, um, for the robot agent. Now for planning, uh, let's keep in mind that uh, uh, the under, in general, the underlying state is unknown, right? Uh, for example, that we do not know the intention of the other uh, interacting vehicles. Uh, what we can have is a belief, which is a probably distribution over the states. Uh, that's not the only representation of belief. Um, it, you can equivalently use a history of observation of, uh, of actions, but, but uh, uh, they are all, all the same. Now, uh, the purpose of planning is to, um, given, a given a belief, choose actions that maximizes the ex expected total reward over time. That's what we want to do. Now, this is an optimization problem. To solve this optimization problem, we want to think of it conceptually is to treat it as a tree search, a tree search in the belief space. And this is my search tree. And every node of this tree represents a belief, a probably distribution over the states, at each of the node that the tree branches on all the actions we can do. And given the action, the further branches on all the observations that we may receive and so on and so forth, right? Now to find the best action, we will apply the Bellman's principle of optimality, which says that uh, we'll choose the best action that maximizes the sum of two terms. One is the immediate reward and the other one is the expected future reward. I need this expectation over the observations because we do, I do not know what observations I'm going to receive in the future. Right? Now, um, by pushing this tree to a sufficiently depth and the back up of the values, and I will be able to find the best action or near optimal action at the root of this uh, at the root, uh, root node. Uh, this is conceptually uh, very simple. And the problem, of course, that is that this tree can become very large. In fact, that it's ex exponential with respect to the height of this tree, the search for the, the planning horizon, and with a branch factor that is equal to the number of actions multiplied by the number of observations. But what's particularly worrisome is this dependency on the number of observations. Now, in robotics, if we use rich sensors, for example, and um, visual camera, uh, the number of observations in the worst case could be the number of different images I have, an enormous number that we can never afford to process. So we need a better planning algorithm. For example, this one, the determinist sparse partially observable tree, which we worked on a few uh, years earlier. Um, details aside, uh, now basically you want a smaller tree. And this tree that, that we call the death bar tree, contains all the action branches. So we will actually consider all the possible action sequences and, and the plans, but it contains only um, a sampled subset of the observations, a very small sampled subset of the observations. Uh, and the K scenarios uh, where um, each uh, scenario is represented as a sequence of uh, um, random numbers. Now this search tree is, is the important thing that this search tree is much uh, smaller. It's, uh, it's uh, number of actions to the power of um, the uh, H multiplied by a factor of K for the K scenarios. 
Now this k uh, does not depend on the number of the observations. Uh, in fact, if you compare with deterministic planning, uh, it's only a factor of k larger. And uh, despite this uh, sparse sampling, we can prove theoretically that the, our um, plan, um, the computed result is near optimal, uh, provided that uh, uh, the optimal plan admits a simple representation. As you probably would have expected that uh, even though that the K does not depend on, the number of scenarios does not depend on the number of observations, it does depend on the size, uh, the representation size of the optimal plan. Okay. Now, if we uh, have a much, um, smaller tree, we can plan much faster, and we can actually do online planning in real time. And here's a general schema for online planning. So uh, we, will have the, we have the planner, uh, given that belief, it will complete, complete, do the search and compute a plan, and we will execute the first step of the plan and then receive the observation from the sensors. And uh, we will um, update the belief and the send the belief, update the belief to the plan and close the cycle, right? Now, if we do this and, and then we can actually run this on a real um, robot vehicle and the main uncertainty here is unknown intention of how the pedestrian is going to walk. Uh, now, if we do this, um, th this is um, do online planning alone. This is roughly the level we can get to. As you can see, this vehicle drives um, at a, a walking speed or maybe a brisk walk, a slow, um, um, slow run. Uh, it can handle a crowd of people around 10, 15 people. This is roughly, we can do a little bit better than that by putting more algorithmic tricks, but this is a level roughly where we can, we can get to. Now, what if we want to do better, uh, like the busy intersection, do more than that, like the intersection that uh, I described earlier? Well, we did something more. Um, now, let's look at this tree again, and this problem again, ask ourselves, why is this problem so hard? Well, intuitively, uh, this tree is too big. It grows too fast. You can just visually look at the scene and imagine all the possible paths that can wind around the different pedestrians. Um, now, this is a difficult search problem. Uh, let's compare it with another search problem that's also very hard, right? So this one, AlphaGo, we are familiar with, right? It's a very difficult search problem as well. Now, they are not exactly the same. Of course, our, our um, problem is a little bit harder. It's partially observable with stochastic dynamics, it's a trending environment, so on and so forth. But still, it is a search problem. Uh, and so um, to um, make a search algorithm faster, roughly there are two main considerations, right? Um, um, to make it reduce the branch factor. Uh, if I have an oracle that tells me that uh, uh, which actions is more likely to be good compared to the others, maybe we can, I can pro prioritize the search and therefore effectively reduce the branch factor. Uh, the other thing we can do is that uh, uh, if we have an uh, um, oracle that tells me uh, the value of the expected future reward of that particular node. Now, if we have that, I can actually just skip the entire subtree below and effectively reduce the tree height. That's very powerful. And that's what we want to do. And in fact, that's we want to uh, learn a policy uh, and the value network that perform the role of this uh, um, oracle. So in fact, that we will learn a single, single network that, 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 that share uh, for both the policy network and the, for both the policy and the value. And they will share a backbone that processes the input, which consists of a history of observations that each consists of the, uh, all the poses of all the interacting vehicles, and they are encoded as, uh, as images that send in a network. And this network has two heads, one outputs the, outputs the action and the other one outputs the value, right? Now to train this network, so we can run uh, the planner, right? The planner will generate uh, the label data and we can use it to train our um, policy and the value network uh, offline. And this um, gives uh, the simplest version 
uh, of our uh, learning from tree search. It's an imitation learning agent. Now, once we learn uh, this uh, um, network, we can use it for search, right? And therefore, uh, then my search becomes better and, and generates new data and feed it again to the learner and, and uh, improve the policy and the value network. And then we can close the, and thus close the planning and the learning um, loop and continuously uh, improve the performance. Now, um, for those of us who care about uh, theoretical performance guarantee, um, with a little bit of work, we can actually uh, retain the theoretical um, guarantee. So what we need to do is to clip, clip the learned values between the uh, upper and the lower bound in the branch and, uh, and branch and bound search. By doing so, we can in fact retain all the theoretical guarantee that I talked about earlier. Now this is, uh, uh, supervised learning. Now, can we do better than that? Now, what if I have we I have also access to a high fidelity simulator, or even I can have access to uh, the real world? Or can we do better? Well, in this case, instead of training the policy and the value network using supervised data from planning, uh, we can directly learn it using reinforcement learning um, in the high fidelity simulator or even in the real world. Once we learned uh, the network, we can again use it for, um, for search. And this time we are going to uh, run the planner uh, in the high fidelity simulator and close the loop. Uh, what happens here is that uh, we, um, our planner uses a simplified approximate model for planning because that's fast. But then we do reinforcement learning in a simulator with a much more realistic model, a high fidelity model to absorb more realistic information from the world. And by closing the loop, we will push some of this into information into planning periodically and therefore improve the overall performance. Now to evaluate our um, methods, uh, we of course cannot quite afford to uh, drive this vehicle uh, into the real road on real road yet. So we build a simulator. So uh, we build a simulator that generates the realistic traffic flow that uh, uh, on top of the color simulator. And we can do this anywhere in the world, anywhere in the sense that uh, any, any place that's covered by the open street map, we can pull the map and generate a realistic traffic uh, flow on top of that. So this is an all simulation result. It's not doing any um, planning yet. Uh, here's the planner. The screen vehicle is the one that's being controlled by the planner. Now, if you some performance comparison, right? So, I mean, you can see that uh, the, the, the uh, learning from tree drive mm, does a lot better than the, the, the imitation learning agent as well as a planner alone, right? And the further that, uh, that if you compare reinforce the reinforcement learning with supervisor learning, reinforcement learning will further improvements because of that it's able to uh, absorb information from a more realistic uh, uh, model. Now uh, let's switch to the uh, learning um, perspective. Now, uh, well, how do we um, put uh, um, pl a planner 
uh, or uh, other structural element into a learned neural network. And what will be the benefits for that? Okay. So here is, comes to our idea of a differentiable algorithm network. Um, the basic idea is the following. We want to treat the neural network as a competition graph. Or intuitively, we can just think of that as some kind of programming language that can uh, encode the model and the algorithm for the planner, um, or for the filter, and for the controllers. And we call this neuronized uh, these uh, algorithms. Here's an example of that. Right? Suppose we want to neuronize a Bayesian histogram filter. Here's a filtering equation. And B is a, a belief, it's a, it's a vector that, that uh, encodes the uh, probability distribution. Every entry of this vector represents a probability uh, of, the, uh, of the agent at a particular state. And T and S are these model parameters. So T is a system, the state transition matrix that represented the state dynamics, and Z is an observation matrix. Right. Now, what you know, we notice over here is that uh, the, the Bayesian histogram filter is basically uh, um, a, a bunch of linear operations uh, or matrix operations. So it can be rewritten as convolutions and it can be represented in the neural network as a convolution layer, right? Now, every layer, um, so the, uh, uh, now the convolution kernel weights and, and actually exactly represents the, uh, uh, the model parameters, the state transition matrix, as well as the, uh, the, um, the observation matrix. So when we train the neural network weights, it's the same as training the model parameters, except that we are training these model parameters in the context of the algorithm that use it. So we are training the models end to end, and that has certain benefits that we're gonna talk about uh, uh, later. Now, uh, here's another example, that another example that we will try to neuronize a QMDP algorithm. If you're not familiar with a QMDP, think of that as a, a, a very approximate decision-making algorithm in a partially observable setting. It makes the approximation that uh, even though that uh, the state is uh, the partially observable for the current time instant, it becomes fully observable after a single action. So it is very approximate. Basically, it's a dynamic pro programming algorithm. It's a value iteration. Okay, so if you look at the value iteration algorithm, and we notice that uh, it's again, it's a bunch of, uh, it's a Bellman's equation. It's again, a bunch of uh, uh, linear operations, right? So we can use convolution there to code them, but we also need, because it's a decision making, so we have to pick, choose the best action. So we have to, in addition, need a maxima, maximization operator, which can be represented uh, as a, a max pool layer. Now, uh, but more than that, uh, value iteration is an iterative algorithm. So each slice of this represents only one iteration of the, uh, of the, of the value iteration algorithm. So for, for K iterations, so I have to replicate these networks at K times and concatenate them all together as a single network. Okay. That's what we do. And now uh, uh, with these ideas, uh, I can uh, uh, represent each of the system components such as filters and planners as a neural network. Now, if we do that, and now each of these system components has a uniform representation, and that is very convenient. And we can compose the system together by just uh, connecting the output of one module to the input of another uh, module and the form uh, uh, compose a learning system that way. Now, this is what we get uh, uh, if I compose the Bayesian uh, filter and the QMDP um, planning module, right? And then I can actually take the output of the planner and then feed it back into the input of the Bayesian filter and that makes it a recurrent neural network. And if I expand it over time, this is what the architecture would look like. Now, uh, so over the uh, past few years that uh, uh, in the robotics community, we actually developed quite a number of such modules, differential robot, robot algorithms for state estimation, for fully observable planning, partially observable planning and control and so on and so forth. This is definitely only a partial list and there are a lot more, unfortunately I cannot list all of them. They are really that a lot of them, especially in the last few, they are expanding very fast, right? I'm sorry that if uh, your favorite net is not listed over here. And we can use all these components to build the robot, and connect them together and build robot learning systems. Now, uh, let's look at a simple example to understand the benefits of doing this. And this is a toy example for robot navigation in a partially observable um, 2D um, 
grid vault and occupancy grid. Right? Now, uh, it's input to the robot system is a, an occupancy map as well as an, a robot observation. Uh, it's a local observation and therefore it is ambiguous. If you can see the two red squares over here, right? It cannot, and that's why it is partially observable. Okay. Now we want to train the robot in an imitation setting. I mean, so we'll use the images to represent the environment, the goal, as well as the initial belief of the robot. And the, the expert trajectories uh, is generated by the QMDP algorithm. And we will train the robot in a variety of different kind of random, random environments. Right? And, we, uh, and then we test it in a new and seen environments. It succeeds in this case, and that's not, not really a surprise. Now, uh, we also test it in a much larger environment and it also looks very different. And this is not a random environment, it's much more structured. Now, if we just use the uh, learned agent network directly on this larger environment, it would not work at all. And the reason is that uh, it's training a much smaller environment. Remember that this, 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 is, this is parameter K, uh, the number of iterations for the, uh, the maximum number of iterations of value iteration uh, algorithm that the, the natural training network just simply would not have enough slices to generate a sufficiently long path in this large environment to cover the to to cover this long path. Okay. However, uh, the benefit of a structure is that now we understand exactly what each of this uh, network slice does. It's just an iteration of the value iteration algorithm. Therefore, after finish training this network, if we want to apply it to a larger environment, I can just replicate this, train the slices multiple times until I, I, I have to get a sufficiently number uh, along path. Right? So this time, in this case, the, the uh, structure enables transfer. Now, uh, structure also improves the learning performance. Um, now, the um, algorithm that the network encodes, in fact, imposes a structure prior on the network, right? Because the network must capture the, the structure of the algorithm. Now we can re relax this uh, structure priors and, and, and loosen it up. For example, that we can use um, uh, a CNN convolution neural network to process the input images, and then, then we can use the LSTM to encode the history. And that can solve our problem as well with uh, a weaker structure. This is roughly the, the architecture of the um, deep Q network, right? Or we can completely loosen all these structure constraints and turn the generic uh, recursive neural network. Now, if we compare the performance as the structure constraints are gradually removed and the success rate uh, decreases and then the path length increases. So the performance starts to degenerate. Uh, we can perform the same comparison experiment, but in this time in a larger environment, the trend is very, is very much the same, but uh, the performance gap, uh, gap becomes much more pronounced. Uh, this is expected because that as the, as the environment becomes larger, the task becomes more challenging and the more important the, the structure is, right? The more benefits the structure affords, and this is expected. Now, what's more surprising uh, is, uh, uh, that uh, this, in this example over here, the trained uh, network, the QMDP net, actually outperforms the, the, the teacher, the QMDP algorithm itself in this particular example and in various other instances as well. This is a little bit surprising because the QMDP algorithm provides the training data for the train QMDP net. And it seems that the, the, the learner is outperforming the teacher and this is a surprising. Now, the reason is the following because the QMDP algorithm is a very approximate algorithm and we apply it together with a ground truth model. And the result of course is approximate and in this particular instance is particularly hard. It's constructed to be hard for the QMDP algorithm because there's a lot of symmetry inside and it's difficult to localize. Now, when we uh, train a neural network, uh, it's still the approximate algorithm, algorithm but except that the QMDP net did not learn the ground truth model. It learned a model to perform well. Uh, in particular, what has learned is that it penalized very hard, artificially hard on those actions that stays put. It encouraged the robot to uh, move around and, and for exploration purpose. So this is very much similar to what uh, an IL engineer uh, would do. 
to, to do reward engineering, except in this case that uh, um, it's not a, a manually um, crafted, it's a learn automatically from data. So end-to-end -end learning um, can compensate for the approximate algorithm. Uh, we do this by encoding the algorithm into a neural network and train it end-to-end. Now, of course, we want to um, also evaluate, try this on a more realistic navigation case. In this case, the partially observable navigation, I give visual navigation again, but in a real 3D uh, environment, right? It's a, so the input robots is uh, uh, RGB images of the rich 3D world, and it also that has a map, which is a 2D occupancy map. Now, uh, uh, Here's roughly what we want to do, right? So initially, robot does not know where it is. And it, uh, now by uh, moving around and getting visual observations, as you can see that it gets more certain of its, its location. And it eventually gets to localize really well and it can navigate towards the goal. This is our, the object of our task. Right now, think about uh, 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 now again that we want to do this in an imitation learning. We want to train the robot in a variety of different environments and eventually uh, try to test it in a new environment. Now, think about how we would want to do this. I and mean, we want to do a pure model based approach. We have to build this, um, uh, modules for state estimation, planning, and the control. Now, one particular difficulty here is uh, about uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, building the observation model, right? Now, uh, this observation model would require us to say that uh, given the current map as well as the robot pose, uh, what's the probability of observing a particular image, right? This is very difficult to build because we have to spend the entire space of all possible images. And I don't know how exactly um, to build it. I mean, we can use a pixel-wise Gaussian model, but it is, uh, uh, it is not very realistic compared to uh, when, we, when, we, when we use it in practice. Okay. Now, alternatively, if you use a pure model three approaches, right? I mean, we can train over the, uh, the large variety of different environments, but then it will be difficult to, to generalize. Now, here is the final evaluation results. While the, the then the differentiable algorithm network is sub substantially output for both the model three approach as well as a model based approach, right? Now the performance gap over here is really because of the structure prior. By imposing this structure on the neural network, we can learn much more effectively. And on the other side, uh, compared to model-based approach, right? so the benefits is that uh, uh, the, by, the, uh, by embedding this algorithm into a neural network and trained end-to-end -end using data, uh, we, uh, we compensate uh, for the various, the imperfection in our modeling assumptions. Now, uh, finally, uh, that uh, um, I want to um, show another example where we want to put the planning and learning together, this case uh, in a hierarchy and let each play out its own strength. Okay. So the task we want to solve is to, again, navigation, visual navigation. Imagine that, uh, that we come to a new place, a new building. Uh, you come to our NUS school computing for the first time. For any of us humans, that all we need is a visitor's map, right, like this. And then you, can, you will be able to find my office and come and navigate around the building. Now, if we replace a human with a robot, well, the robot also needs a map. But not this visitor's map, usually uh, a high resolution and point cloud, right? Now the question is, uh, can we uh, replace this high, uh, I, um, high resolution 3D point cloud with a visitor's map and the robot still can navigate? And that's what we want to do. Now, so we can come up with a two level uh, architecture at the high level. We just use, we just really literally download the visitor's map from our school's website with a little bit of image processing that we turn into an occupancy grid, then we can apply a search algorithm um, to search for a path, right? Uh, so as a high low, it seems very uh, straightforward. Now to actually execute the path, uh, we need a, a low level navigation controller. So we, uh, we are going to use the input to this navigation controller consists of uh, um, a single monocular camera uh, looking forward, all right? Uh, as well as uh, this image, which we call intention, right? Uh, at the robot's current location. So 
so intention contains three channels of information. One is a piece of trajectory that the robot is about to execute in the, in the local region. And also, which is marked in blue over here. And also that uh, uh, a piece of trajectory the robot just executed, as well as the uh, local environment. They code it together into a single image. So we'll train a neural network, take these two inputs, these two images, the molecular camera image as well as the intention, and output uh, an action for the robot to execute. The robot will execute it and will re-localize with respect to uh, the course map, and then and the recompute the plan and the, that closer loop. Right? So um, at the high level, uh, we choose planning because we have uh, a course map that can serve as a model that enable us to plan and to cope with the combinatorial complexity of routing, right? At the low level, we actually have to, uh, we don't have a model, building a model at the low level to handle all the perceptual uh, complexity is very difficult. Therefore we learn, right? So this is the motivation of our two level architecture. We also in inspired uh, basically by um, human driving uh, under uh, a GP, a GP, a GPS guidance, right? So this is uh, what you usually see on a, on, a, on a GPS unit or your mobile phone, right? And uh, uh, on the corner, you will see that the GPS will give instructions and 0.2 miles ahead, make a left. Uh, this is uh, very similar to our intention, except that our intention is a little bit richer in terms of the information captured over there, okay? Now, uh, so essentially that uh, our low level intention controller uh, replaces uh, the human driver, right? Now let's look at the, the results. We, we train our... So you see that we, our training environment is, is very different from the testing environment. The training environment is carpeted and the testing environment is laminated the floor and with a sort of furniture on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, in the hallway as well. And also the, our building is on a hill and in the training environment, it's, it's spread out with all sorts of rooms while on the, on the testing environment, it's just basically a long hall corridor. And we are actually gathering data and training our robots in a variety of different environments, uh, as you can see over here with people around uh, in different buildings, uh, in different environments, some of it with lots of glasses. We also uh, kind of taking, uh, um, start to take the robot outdoors as well. Uh, on the low, uh, upper left, you can see that it's going through a glass door. And what's interesting in the glass, this glass door is it's not even ma marked on the map. Uh, so uh, this is a little bit of an infomercial that the robot cannot call the elevator. Uh, what it's actually doing over here is that the, the elevator door opens, it actually just moves in, okay? So what I wanna do here is eventually build a robot system that can actually go anywhere on our NUS campus using just a planar uh, uh, visitor's map. Okay. Uh, now let me uh, try to um, wrap up. Um, we have three, see three different instances of integrating planning and learning. Uh, in the first case that we put planning, uh, we put learning into planning that makes our planner much more scalable. In the second case that uh, we put planner and other structural elements uh, into a learn neural network that made the network more structured, more interpol, it's modular and composable. And on the, on the, on the flip side, and that uh, the end-to-end -end learning makes our planner um, more robust because it compensates for the uh, assumptions, I mean, uh, modeling assumptions of our planner. Um, we also try to put uh, uh, the planner and the learner into a hierarchy and let each place out the, uh, um, play, play out its own individual uh, strength. Now, um, unfortunately, we don't have a systematic way to choose when, um, when to plan and when to learn. But this example, uh, at least I hope that it indicates that, uh, that uh, uh, 
the deep understanding of the core task characteristic is essential uh, for making uh, informed choices. And, and there, there are uh, many um, different possible combinations over here. So um, our work cannot answer all the questions about when to plan and, uh, and uh, when to learn. But I hope that, that we have provided enough evidence that putting together planning and learning um, that it is indeed possible to get the best of the both worlds. Uh, so instead of uh, arm wrestling, um, we probably want to um, build bridges. And as a result, um, building truly scalable robust decision systems that, that's capable of generalizing over uh, a wide range of highly variable environments. Uh, to end, uh, uh, I want to thank all the wonderful people I have been fortunate to work with and the colleagues as well as, uh, as uh, uh, the postdoc and students. It's a real pri privilege to work with all of them. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, there is a, a, a few questions here, uh, but we are actually running over time. So I will forward the questions to you. Right, and uh, uh, so you can reply to them directly. Uh, but thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And I uh, so, will, uh, uh, yes? Uh, should I uh, reply offline? Yes, please, yeah. I, I will uh, type it in, in, the, uh, in the chat and, uh, and you can reply offline, right? Okay. But I'll hand it over now to uh, Gerard, who is chairing the uh, uh, next session. And uh, by the way, if any of you have questions, please type in the Q&A uh, and I will forward them to uh, David. Thank you again.